Hi, I'm Bob Brown. Wanted to welcome everybody to the worship service of First Christian Church. Thank you for being with us this day. We are still practicing social distancing and all of us, whether it be First Christian Church, City of Lufkin, Angelina County, we're all trying to go by the rules and do everything we can to protect each other. And we thank you for being a part of this. Please be in prayer for all of those that have experienced COVID virus, those that have lost family, those that have lost loved ones. We also want to talk about the George Floyd incident. We love everyone in Lufkin, Texas, and what we would like to do is have each one of you be in prayer and that remember all lives matter. Thank you for being with us this day, and God bless you. We have gathered in this place to worship because Jesus invites us to come. We come as we are, with our faith and our doubts, with our successes and our failures, because Jesus invites us to come. We come with what we have, bringing with us the events and experiences of this past week, because Jesus invites us to come. We come bearing the injustices we have seen, the violence we have seen, the apathy and disinterest that convicts us, because Jesus invites us to come. We come with understanding that we are called to do better, to listen, to seek to understand, to bear witness to the loss and the pain of the oppressed, because Jesus invites us to come. Let us worship God together.
As we join our hearts together in prayer, we continue to rem remember all those who are dealing with the effects of COVID-19, for healthcare workers and others on the front lines who battle that every day, for those who have been sick in our community or others that we know and those we don't know, for all who grieve the loss of someone due to illness of any kind. We remember too today George Floyd and his family and all who grieve his loss. We pray for our country in the midst of riots and protests. We pray for all of our brothers and sisters of color, and we pray for an end to all violence. We join our hearts together in prayers for peace and resolution. Will you join me in prayer? God of all peoples, we cry out to you today because we are hurting. We are divided from each other, which means that we cannot fully connect with you either. When you created humankind, you created us in, our, in your image. And yet we continue to hurt each other as if we can't see the God image in one another. And when we hurt others, we hurt you. Instead of seeing you in our neighbors, we see something other, something different. We see strangers, we see enemies. Our vision has been blurred. We do not see clearly. And so we confess our collective sin of racism and our complicity with systems that perpetuate racism. We confess that we have been comfortable so we have ignored the discomfort of our brothers and sisters. We have neglected some of your children, our neighbors. Forgive us our comfort. Forgive us our complacency. Forgive us our inaction. We ask that you would light a Pentecost fire deep within our hearts that makes us yearn for justice for all of our neighbors. Help us to tend that fire within us, to guard the flame and to keep it burning so that our passion for justice remains kindled and our compassion for others never dies. Embolden us with the power of your Holy Spirit that we might answer your call to go to all the nations, to all peoples, to proclaim your message of love that is for each and for all. And help us to start here, in our hometowns, in our city streets, in our neighborhoods. Clear our eyes so that we can see. Open our ears that we might listen. Expand our hearts that we might love generously, that we might live generously in peace with all of our brothers and sisters, your beloved children, each and all. And wherever we are, in all the places that we have discovered that we can worship and call out to you, even now, we pray with one voice the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive the debts of others. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to take a moment just to talk with the kids who are out there, although the grown-ups who are with you can listen along as well. I want to talk about the Great Commission, which is the special scripture that we'll hear this morning in just a little bit. In it, Jesus tells his disciples right before he gets ready to leave, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples and teach them what I've taught you and you can baptize them and, and help them to follow me the way that you follow me. I wonder in this time when we're staying mostly at home, how we can go 
and make disciples everywhere. How we can reach out to people in lots of different places. You know, one of the interesting things about staying at home is a lot of us have learned to use technology in a new way. And we've discovered that we can talk to people across the country or in different cities or even in different parts of the world. So maybe you can have a conversation with somebody you know, somebody your family knows who lives far away. I wonder if you might even send a card or a picture. I know that I love to see your artwork and I know a lot of people who do too. And so maybe you could draw a card or make a note or send a kind thought or share some good news with a friend by dropping something in the mail. I know that you all are smart and creative and you'll come up with some way to share good news, to let people know that God loves them. And I look forward to hearing what those things might be. Will you pray with me? Dear God, help us to find ways to reach out and share your good news. We're so glad that you love us. Help us to share that love with other people too. Whether we shout it from our rooftops or send a card in the mail or talk to somebody far, far away. Help us to find all different ways and use all different ways to share your love. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, 
and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. May God add God's blessing to the reading of this word. Amen. You know, I've had many experiences in ministry that have affirmed, lifted up, and restored my calling to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. When a former youth once told me that a comment I made to them at camp, an encouragement, was uh, one of the pushes that first started her on her path to ministry, I was floored. To know that I had a part, however small it may have actually been, in clarifying God's call on her life was testament to the call that I have felt. I felt recharged and renewed from that one comment that she made in a Facebook post. I could name many other moments of grace and moments filled with the Holy Spirit, and many of them would be centered around the camping ministry, but I'm trying to keep this under an hour. I imagine that that's how many of the disciples felt on that day that Matthew describes in the final words in his gospel, filled with excitement over what they had witnessed, ready to go out and proclaim the news, so that filled with the spirit and enthusiasm of ministry that seemed like anything was possible. That must have been what most of them felt. Most, but not all. See, for every mountaintop experience in ministry, there are probably about a dozen low spots. That seems to be the rhythm of ministry, and thankfully those mountaintop experiences are so much more powerful than the lows that even a 1 to 12 ratio, it still comes out on the positive. However, that doesn't make going through the low points any easier. Those low points are where the doubt and exhaustion to work to overwhelm that feeling of call, that connection with God that exists in each of us. I imagine that's where those disciples who Matthew calls out in verse 17 were. He tells us that when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I have to say that when I'm in one of those low places, that is one of the verses that gives me hope, that there were some of those disciples who doubted. Now, when we first hear that, our inclination would be to hear it as Matthew saying that these disciples were perhaps unworthy or unwelcome there. But on closer reading, that's not what happens. These doubting disciples did not hang back. They didn't work against others. There wasn't any distinction made between the two groups other than that one group had some doubts. Matthew doesn't even say what they were doubting. Was it the resurrection? The future of the movement of Christ? Their ability to be leaders in the future? We don't know what they doubted, just that they have some doubts. But it's what Matthew doesn't say that's just as important. He doesn't say that those who doubted didn't worship Jesus. He says that they worshiped Jesus, but some doubted. Even the doubters worshiped Jesus. And then Jesus' words come through. He addresses his words to all of them, the doubters and the non-doubters alike. He doesn't make a distinction between them, doesn't say that the doubters are unworthy or that they should just go home now. Listen to his words again. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. I think that last bit may have been especially directed towards those who doubted. Jesus gives them directions and commandments, telling them what their next task is, and it is a big one. But he leaves them and us with a promise. Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. No condemnation, no bullying, no calling them out, just encouragement. Jesus knows that what they are going to be doing is going to be hard. They're going to lose friends and family. They're going to lose life and limb. They have the task of changing the world in the most fundamental way, overthrowing the status quo and speaking truth to power and privilege. No wonder there are some who doubt that they can do this monumental task. That is a big ask, a huge ask. And it seems like a task bigger than they can probably imagine. I know how they feel after this week. I started this sermon and restarted this sermon many, many times. 
As I look around at what is happening in our country, I, I wonder how I can preach about this in a way that is genuine, uplifting, and true to the gospel, but that won't push away people at the same time. There is much happening that is polarizing and divisive, and much of that division is being encouraged by the very leaders that should be promoting unity and peace. And it all comes on the heels of three plus months of dealing with the COVID pandemic, which is still far from over. We are fortunate that the violence and antagonism that we have witnessed in other cities has so far been averted here in Angelina County, but that doesn't mean that the same issues and evils don't exist here. We've all contributed to systems of oppression against others, willingly, knowingly or not, simply because we are all part of this together. I cannot absolve myself of complicity, nor do I want to. My doubts and fears have been stronger than ever this past week, wondering what I can do, what I can say, how can I do it so that it comes from a place of love? I do not say this because I lean to one side or the other, but because I am pushed by the Holy Spirit and the gospel to speak out. I'm grateful for the words of former President George W. Bush in a statement he released earlier this week. He lays the problems facing us bare with his words, saying it remains a shocking failure that many African Americans, especially young African American men, are harassed and threatened in their own country. It is a strength when protesters, protected by responsible law enforcement, march for a better future. This tragedy, and a long series of similar tragedies, raises a long overdue question. How do we end systemic racism in our society? The only way to see ourselves in a true light is to listen to the voices of so many who are hurting and grieving. Those who set out to silence those voices do not understand the meaning of America or how it becomes a better place. He goes on to say that we can only see the reality of America's needs by seeing it through the eyes of the threatened, oppressed, and disenfranchised. That is exactly where we now stand. Many doubt the justice of our country and with good reason. Black people see the repeated violation of their rights without an urgent and adequate response from American institutions. We know that lasting justice will only come by peaceful means. Looting is not liberation and destruction is not progress. But we also know that lasting peace in our communities requires truly equal justice. The rule of law ultimately depends on the fairness and legitimacy of the legal system. And achieving justice for all is the duty of all. This will require a consistent, courageous, and creative effort. We serve our neighbors best when we try to understand their experience. We love our neighbors as ourselves when we treat them as equals in both protection and compassion. There is a better way, the way of empathy and shared commitment and bold action and a peace rooted in justice. I am confident that together Americans will choose the better way. Not everyone agrees with everything that Bush did as president, but nobody could doubt that he was a man of faith, and his faith shines through in these words. Faith that our nation can and should be a better place, and faith that we can only make it so by working together. Now it's easy to judge what is happening by the worst examples of each side. That is what is mainly on the news. The looters and arsonists and murderers the shocking brutality of police response against peaceful protesters. We see these images because they are the ones that are most likely to keep us glued to whatever news station is showing them. The images of peaceful protesters marching arm in arm with police, the images of black men forming a human shield around a policeman cut off from his comrades in order to protect him from possible violence, the images of dialogue and honest desire to make changes. These images are the ones that flash on the screen for a few minutes, but they are the ones showing where change is happening, where faith is being lived out. It's not easy to see where the truly faithful people are in all of this because all too often they are not posing in front of a camera. They are working behind the scenes with their Bibles open, using scriptures as a guide to find ways to solve the very real, very life-threatening, soul-threatening problems that face us. Part of the reason that this sermon was so difficult was because of the scripture for this week. I've been looking ahead to plan worship for the next couple of months, and many of the scriptures for the upcoming weeks in the lectionary would fit so much better for this week. 
Jesus talking about taking up the sword and setting mother against daughter and father against son and, and what that all means in the context of the gospel. Or Jesus describing what the kingdom of God is like in way after way after way. Jesus using parables to describe how the word of God reaches us in unexpected ways. Any of these just seem to work so well with our current context. But instead we have the scripture at the end of Matthew's gospel where Jesus leaves his disciples for good. I think that there's reason for this. Maybe it is because it is easy to feel like Jesus has gone out of the world right now. Maybe because we're supposed to figure out how to make disciples and baptize while still social distancing. Or maybe it's because even then, even as Jesus was ascending to heaven after the resurrection, there were those who had doubts about the future. And who among us can say that we honestly don't right now? But even those who doubted did not let their doubt keep them from spreading the good news, from working to change the world, from being a part of this beautiful, unorganized movement of the Christian church. That is what we all need right now. That and the reminder that Jesus is with us always to the end of the age. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we see the oppression and the strife around us, as we hear the voices calling us to choose a side, to demonize those who choose differently from us, as we hear voices of division seeking to tear us apart, remind us that you hold us together, that Jesus is with us always to the end of the age, and that we have the opportunity to go out and do tremendous works in spite of, or maybe because of, our doubts. Help us in the weeks and months and years ahead to use those doubts to strengthen our bond with you to feel your presence with us and to commit to making change in this world so that we are all welcome and that we all feel welcome and safe in all things. For we know that that is what the kingdom of God is like. We give you thanks and praise in the name of our ever-present Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Each week, as we gather around this table, we remind one another that all are welcome here, that there are no barriers that keep any of us from being at this table, from being in the presence of Christ. And yet, when we leave this table, we are reminded that we live in a world where this is not the case for most people, that not everyone is welcome at every table, that there are places where hatred and bigotry and racism still exist, that people are judged and excluded because of the color of their skin, because of their beliefs, because of any number of factors. And yet, as we gather at this table, we have a respite, an opportunity to take a piece of this welcome and bring it to the world. That is what Christ was doing as he welcomed all who were gathered that night, as he took the bread and he held it up and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them and said, this is my body broken for you. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and having blessed it, he shared it with them saying, take, drink, all of you. This cup is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you come together to eat this bread and drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. As we partake of this communion feast, let it nourish our souls so that we may go out seeking to make this world a better place, seeking to acknowledge our parts in the sins that are that surround us all. We are all a part of it. And yet we are offered this opportunity for forgiveness and reconciliation together. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you just now and thank you for your risen Son. We thank you for this table. We thank you for the bread and we thank you for the cup. As we eat the bread, we remember the broken body. And as we drink the cup, we remember his spilled blood. Our prayer is that you would touch each one of us, that you would hold each one of us, that you would make us stronger, and that we could go out and tell others of your risen son. In your precious name we pray and ask. Amen.
Great Commission invites us to go and make disciples. And one of the things that we learn about discipleship is that disciples are generous. Disciples are people who have gifts in abundance and gifts to share with the world. And so we invite you at the close of this worship to consider the gifts that you might offer this week. They come in many shapes and sizes and we hope that you'll find a way to reach out to somebody and to share a gift with them, a gift that only you can give. And if you're able to give financially, we invite you to be generous in that way as well. You can give to the church and the ministries that we support so that your money might go even to the ends of the earth. We invite you to give online through the, the church website or the Shelby Giving app, or you can send a check in the mail. Let us be generous with our giving and with our lives as we seek to be disciples and make disciples and share discipleship. And now may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with favor and grant you peace as you go this day to be a disciple and to share the good news. Amen. Thank you.